will be it doesn't matter how, how much the infrastructure grows, how much the charging networks grow, pilots uh, you know, trained even, the, the biggest constraint is going to be how quickly they can make the vehicles. And so I think, you know, Joby, as we've talked about it before, uh, all sorts of strides to work with, you know, key partners. Talking Joby here today with Travis out of California. Thanks for taking the time again. Always a great pleasure. And we're talking about the Delta contract in the context of total addressable market. And we've got a nice uh, pie chart here just showing two very different takes. For me, it basically means that uh, no one's got a crystal ball and it is with a high level of uncertainty of what that market is going to look like. Or Stein, what's your take? Yeah, Arne, I couldn't agree more. Uh, I mean, if someone makes a prediction for the long term, the only thing you know is that it's going to be wrong. Uh, they might have the direction right, but uh, the magnitude of the direction will never be correct. And I think that's the same thing in investing. Valuations will always be wrong. There will be information you have an accountant for. And the same in a TAM uh, calculation, total addressable market. And I think that fits perfectly into your example of the of the horse carriages uh, to car transition. So uh, yeah, Arne, please uh, tell us your story about horses and cars. Yeah, early 20th century horses to cars, a very, very good example of uh, how total addressable markets can actually expand. Long story short, if you take the total passenger miles traveled with a horse in 1900, um, the number is 60 billion. When the automobile then came along, clocked up around 100 million miles in 1900. So people thought, okay, this is, if it ever does completely replace the horse, then the total addressable market is also going to be 60 billion miles with a car. By 1930, of course, we we had the Ford Model T that of course accelerated the transition from horse to car and the addressable market moved to around 3.6 billion by 1910. But if you would now guess where we are today, um, we are currently at around 3 trillion vehicle miles, which is about a 50x of what the horse mile market was in 1900. Now, of course, that's a long time span. And we're always using this here as an example that it is very difficult unless you have a good crystal ball to really um, estimate what that market is going to look like. Sure. In terms of, you know, the report that we're looking at here is from 2021. Obviously, we've had a lot of great progress um, over the last little bit of time, uh, and some of them are specifically called out here. So uh, battery density and fast charging just you know, within the last couple of weeks, I've seen something where uh, Formula E, so the electric version of, of Formula One, um, they're testing some fast charging unit that can do in 30 seconds, um, you know, some 10% you know, of the battery or something like along those lines. Uh, obviously, Tesla continues to roll out their charging network. So as all things EV, not just whether that's EV toll or EV you know, passenger cars or trucks or whatever, um, the, you know, more and more vehicles will transition. Everybody will feel the benefits of that. Uh, also high power electric motors, obviously um, the Joby vehicle in particular has motors that are multiple times more powerful than a Tesla Model S Plaid. Um, 3D manufacturing, you know, Joby hasn't spoken a lot about this, but from my time touring the factory, we didn't have access to a facility that was, you know, doing 3D printing of titanium and you know, all sorts of other you know, crazy alloys, things for the vehicle. So again, we can go down the list, but uh, a lot of um, things that have helped build us to where we are. Uh, and then, you know, maybe to talk a little bit towards the, the TAM side of things, obviously um, going from the horse to the car still happened uh, on the plane that was, you know, on earth, on the ground all in one space uh, as we look to you know what we can do if we could fly you know with with uh, you know, our wings wings aren't clipped so to speak we could really kind of fly everywhere and create you know different routes different networks that'll be where people live people work um, you know as you mentioned per previously there isn't a crystal ball i think that's that's good enough to tell us where that is um, and, and from my perspective since that will grow over time and will evolve um, you know, we can make some presumptions, but they're very generalized. I think the biggest thing that is tangible will be, it doesn't matter how, ma how much the infrastructure grows, how much the charging networks grow, pilots, uh, you know, trained even, the, the biggest constraint is gonna be how quickly they can make the vehicles. And so I think, you know, Joby, you've talked about it before, uh, all sorts of strides to work with, you know, key partners, um, obviously one of which in terms of making the vehicles is gonna be Toyota um, and, and ways that they can, not just at Joby's factory in Dayton, but um, Toyota, you know, they have a deal to do 
a lot of different components. And you know, could Toyota potentially leverage you know, some of their facilities that they are you know, currently have for automobiles to have some portion of that facility then make components for eVTOL. Uh, I think you know, that's what I'm most excited about um, to see can they make 500 of these in a year. Um, then things really get interesting in terms of you know, TAM. Yeah, and talking about Toyota, um, you just mentioned the number of units that Joey will be able to produce that. That's one of the key equations here. And if we look at this chart, it's very, very interesting because these are current Toyota production sites for various components in North America. And Travis, which one is the closest to the new location of Joby? Yes, yeah, so the new facility will be in Dayton, Ohio. Um, so the uh, facility here that's uh, TMMK would be in Kentucky, uh, and that is just uh, you know within a two hour drive of Dayton. So you can see here quite a large facility. Yeah, and it's uh, the Toyota Motor Manufacturing in, in Kentucky, a massive site. You can see the picture here. They're currently producing engines for the Camry and for, so for various automobiles and they're also producing cars. As Toyota also transitions away from combustion engines, of course, we don't know the, the details of that transition plan, but it could be a good option for Joby. I mean, just look at how massive that site is, qualified personnel there, engineers on site. So that could be a good option for Joby going forward to tap into the capacity that their partner Toyota brings into the game. Yeah, and just I think one, as I'm looking here uh, as well at that graphic, you'll see that the amount of vehicles and units that they can produce is um, respectively was 400 something thousand and 300 uh, something thousand. So if you're making 300,000 automobile engines on an annual basis, and Joby only, you know, it would be a great year if Joby could make 500 vehicles so that means if they could make 500, you know, they're not necessarily making the motors, but 500 of some component or, you know, a thousand of that component. So there's enough for all the vehicles and spare parts. You know, spare parts are going to be a huge thing the more and more vehicles that we scale as well, right? That was a, a, a pain point for Tesla at the beginning in terms of service and whatnot. They just didn't have spare parts. So anyway, that, that's exciting, um, you know, to see that, that facility, and that's from, you know, 2011, um, you know, almost the time of horse and buggies, it seems like uh, nowadays is early 2024, but 300, 400,000 vehicles or, or engines, um, that's really exciting. I think they could probably spare a little section of that facility to, uh, to make some spare parts for Joby, especially if it's only a two-hour drive.